Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Writing for Your Life. Today, we are here with David Morris from Zondervan. David's the publisher of the um, Zondervan division, and uh, he is going to talk to us today about the big picture from a publishing perspective. So, David, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Um, we'll go for... Um, you know, the bulk of the time we have together with David's presentation and we'll allow time for Q&A at the end. And um, you can enter your questions into the chat box and I'll relay them on to David when we have an opportunity to do so. So David, take it away. Okay, happy to. Hey, thanks for being here, everyone who's here. Um, hope you're having a good day and I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, it's, an, it's a great opportunity for me to give back a little bit and uh, share some of the insights that come from working on the inside of a major publishing house like Zondervan and HarperCollins Christian Publishing. Um, what I'd like to do today is um, talk a little bit about myself just to give you a better sense of who I am and uh, also to uh, go over the big picture in publishing, like Brian said, the landscape of publishing, um, but also the um, uh, what's going on in the marketplace and what's working and what are the movements and meanings uh, for our world today? What do you actually write about? So just a few thoughts along those lines from a publisher's point of view. Uh, work on, let me just work a little bit here on uh, practicing sharing my slides. Um, hopefully you can see those now, a little bit more about me. Um, I am a, uh, I have a PhD in religion and psychology, never really planned on being in publishing. Um, but uh, started out at a small academic house, um, just paying the bills while I was in grad school. And uh, just started to realize that, hey, you know, there could be something here for a career for me. It wasn't something I planned on doing. Um, I didn't really fall in love with it right away either. It was something that seemed to uh, grab me and pull me in instead. Um, I worked for, uh, initially after that small academic house, Guidepost Magazine. Um, that was a great opportunity because in their book division, um, I helped um, acquire books to sell through the mail to their vast mailing list. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to see the broad field of all of the religious publishing that's out there. We went out looking high and low for uh, books that would work for that audience. So I got to meet with all the publishers, uh, both New York publishers as well as uh, Christian publishers and regional publishers across the country and it it really gave me a strong sense of you know What's out there? Uh, what are the different offerings? What are the titles? What's working and what's not and I hope to sort of share that point of view I take it with me into my current role as well um, So after 16 years at guideposts, I was honored to be asked to work at Zondervan a very well-known uh, large evangelical Christian publishing house based here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And um, here we work with the, uh, we try to publish books for the general Christian reader. Um, you know, we do have an academic division, we have a kids division, uh, we have Bibles, of course, um, but my group is responsible for working with authors who can reach the person in the pew, mostly. Uh, the person who's looking for, uh, daily spiritual growth, new insights, uh, new ways of seeing truth in, in timeless ways. Uh, we work with authors with large platforms, uh, such as a large church with a great big network, uh, a big speaking schedule, um, someone who has a very successful blog or online presence. Uh, but we also work with writers who just writing in their own right um, have come up with great unique concepts and um, have taken those concepts and written really good books, executed well-written manuscripts, and uh, have grown a readership from book to book to book. Um, and that's a really exciting process to see that happen. I love both ends of that, uh, both the, the large platform author and sometimes celebrities uh, to the writer who's just carving out a, uh, a writing life uh, from scratch. So what I do is I manage a team of editors uh, who are acquiring books and uh, marketers who help market the books as well as support staff. 
I work in a company that um, has a very large sales staff that's getting the books out there into all of the nooks and crannies of the marketplace, not just the big ones that you might know about, but everywhere. Um, and uh, just, a, just a great support leadership here at HarperCollins Christian Publishing. It's a real honor to work here. It's a fast paced uh, job where you feel like you're working with the influencers, but also helping influence the world out there for the good. So, um, as I mentioned on the, uh, well, here's a little quote. Uh, just well, to David, sort of we're, you. We're, not, we're not able to see your slides. Oh, um, you're not able to see my slides. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, there's that green button on the upper left hand corner. Yep. Thank you. All right. Getting the bugs worked out. Well, there's me. Nice picture. There we go. <laughs> my Twitter <laughs> account, which you're welcome to check out. Um, and then uh, just, a, just a little encouraging uh, quote to get us started with from an author that I've been reading lately, Howard Thurman, a uh, well-known uh, African-American uh, theologian, thinker, poet, uh, from his book, Meditations of the Heart, Keep Alive the Dream. For as long as a man has a dream in his heart, he cannot lose the significance of living. So just an overview of what I'm going to talk about, landscape of publishing, what's going on in the marketplace right now, and what are the movements and meanings for our world today. The landscape of religious publishing, uh, I'll just leave this slide up briefly. Uh, I think it can, divide, can be divided into three main categories that you see there on the first bullet point, denominational, Christian evangelical, and generalist, and broad, or broad market. Uh, and what I'm going to encourage you to do is research and inhabit and familiarize where you belong in this marketplace. And to also just conclude by saying, don't believe the naysayers. A book deal with the publishers is, is very much worth it. So let me just uh, sort of speak more extemporaneously here. Um, the, uh, like I said, it can be divided, the, mar the religious publishing marketplace can be divided into three categories. Denominational houses are uh, more tradition specific, um, you know, whether it's uh, Methodist, Episcopalian, uh, more of the liturgical traditions, Catholic, uh, other faiths, Muslim, Buddhism. Uh, they all have houses that are, are smaller and they're very specific to the kinds of uh, uh, writers and thinkers in those areas. Um, then there is what I would call the, um, the uh, broader evangelical publishing houses uh, like, like Zondervan or Thomas Nelson, part of HarperCollins Christian Publishing or Baker Publishing House, uh, Tyndale, um, Faith Words. These are houses that sort of connect between all of the uh, evangelical denominations, but try to reach all of them together at the same time. Um, and it's 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 pretty big business. It's a it's a pretty far reach. Um, a lot of the New York houses they don't always realize just how strong um, Christian publishing is, um, and and it, it all overlaps. But when you get into um, that that charge of trying to reach the everyday person in the pew, there's a lot of folks out there, especially in this world that is a little more. Uh, not denomination specific, shall we say. Uh, there's a lot more non-denominational churches out there, and it's important to find a way to reach those readers in ways that 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 many of them can connect with uh, certain authors. And then there's um, the uh, sort of generalist uh, pu uh, religious publishing house, broad market, more seeker oriented. Some of those houses would be like Harper One, our colleagues in San Francisco. Um, I believe Crown or Harmony or uh, Tarcher is another imprint. Uh, and they tend to span a lot of different faiths. It depends on the publisher in charge of that division. Um, but they aren't necessarily uh, evangelical specific. Uh, and, and, you know, and they, they are, they're large and they, read, they publish books that, that get way out there. But I do want to emphasize that, you know, a lot of authors try to work with our, our house because uh, we have an ability to really get out there um, and reach Christian bookstores um, to, to know what the big platforms are to get Christian books into people's hands. So what does is, what is success look like for you? Where would you fit as a writer? Um, and just, just some, I think, pretty good common sense, but, but uh, some points that I think uh, are easily overlooked. 
are not given enough attention um, as you keep going in your journey. Um, first off, I'd like to just say that be sure you've researched uh, the books that are in the area that you that you think you belong in. Who are those publishers? What are the topics that they're publishing? Who are those authors? Uh, go to that publisher's website. Study their catalogs. A lot of them, a lot of them publish their catalogs online, um, and you can look way back in their uh, backlist into the history of the books that they've published. Um, there's there's really a lot there than you might think. Um, look and see what they've published recently. See uh, see what's working for them. See if you can get a sense of, of what books out there have been uh, hitting the bestseller lists in the religion categories. Um, and, and just continue to do your homework. And, and what I like to say, as I said in my initial slide, is really try to inhabit that area that you're in. Um, you know, read deeply in the books that you love, but familiarize yourselves with the ones that you don't that are in your category. I don't think anything can uh, replace that kind of research. Um, when we look at proposals, um, just was in our editors meeting this morning, um, it's, it's always a little bit frustrating when you see an author, um, especially if it's been agented submitted, where uh, it doesn't really look like they've refined that um, concept all that well, that it's, that it's maybe not as strategic as it could be. Uh, does it, does it, where, where does that book actually fit? Uh, we were working with an author this morning who uh, was a journalist first, and um, then he became a pastor. He was a, an award-winning journalist, actually, uh, well-known, hitting all the major media outlets. And um, he, uh, he became a pastor, and his first book was more of a journalistic approach to what's going on in evangelicalism in America, and it sold fairly well, got a lot of attention. But his second book, it was more... Um, you know, it was more encouragement, more spiritual growth, which was good. It's what we publish. And it was it's definitely a helpful book, especially for those hurting and in pain. Uh, but it didn't quite get that attention. And it didn't quite uh, capture his readership from the last book that he uh, published. And in, a, and in a sense, perhaps, uh, you know, God's called him to be a journalist, but also a pastor. So was he really finding the right confluence of those two things and just erring too far in one direction. So we asked him to rework his proposal and uh, we we're just looking at it this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that he did a great job. It seems like a much more balanced book. It's gonna be full of facts and information like you'd expect from a journalist, but also really good takeaways as to how we're supposed to make sense of this world that we're living in today. So uh, I, I think just being very strategic, um, you know, when you when you go and you look at the books in a bookstore or in a library, uh, look inside the table, look inside the acknowledgments if they're there. See who the agent is that they that they uh, mention, or who the editors are. Find out what that agent has um, also published. Go to that agent's website. Sometimes there's a lot of information there. Um, find out who those editors have also what they have also worked on just get a better sense of this whole universe that, that we're in, in publishing, and you'll get a better idea as to how to position yourself within it and find your own unique space. Um, so uh, just to conclude this, well, just, just to make another point um, and answer probably a question that I think perhaps is on a lot of your minds is, what is a large publisher like Zondervan uh, and HarperCollins Christian looking for. And if I had to answer that myself, uh, my, my um, probably most strategic answer is we're looking for authors uh, who see the long view of their writing career. Um, is it just, it's not just one book idea or two book ideas. How can we look at having a long-term relationship, start off with a good book, but go from there and just build, build, build. Um, how can we get to know you, the author, better? Um, how can we help you grow your platform? How can we help you write better books as you go? Um, how can we help you grow your readership from book to book? Probably the, from a purely business point of view, probably the, 
the most, um, the, the holy grail is to find an author who maybe starts off small, but the book is just so well executed that it takes off and it takes on a life of its own and it, and it grows a readership all of its own. That still happens. And, and, and from a publisher's point of view, that upfront investment is, is relatively, it's, it's very reasonable. Um, and we start off humbly, but we grow into, into hopefully great grandeur and great glory. Um, and, and that's, if we can do that growth together, uh, the dividends are just extraordinary. Um, it's different when major authors are hopping around from publisher to publisher. And some of that goes on, not as, not a whole lot, but it's not always as easy to create, to sustain that success from publisher to publisher. I think it's really important to, you know, think of your publishing career as one that is with one publisher um, because that's where you're really going to be able to maximize the relationship. And really this is a relational business and the more that the stronger that relationship, the more success you'll find. So we're looking for authors who see their career as long-term. I'd also like to say that you've got a good team around you, that you're not just working in isolation. Uh, who would that team be? It might be a literary agent. Most of our uh, manuscripts, most of our books are agented. Um, it might be a writing group. Uh, it might be that you've hired an assistant to help you uh, organize yourself, to help you get your speaking going, to do help you with some of your online marketing. And if you want to take it even further, uh, maybe you'd even hire a digital marketing manager to help you with your online platform. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that specifically as we go forward, because I think it's something that is um, feels like a lot of mystery and a lot of work, uh, but there are some there are some simple strategies to follow in making that kind of thing work for you. But in terms of what we're looking for, we we are looking for pastors who ha are are uh, um, who lead some of the largest churches in America who have great networks. Uh, those are platforms that we can we can leverage to help get their book out. Those who've got a great speaking ministry, uh, Christine Kane is one of our authors, and she's she's just fabulous in terms of reaching people on her own terms. Uh, bloggers, owners of interesting websites, podcasters who've built up a great audience, um, engaged audience, that's really the key phrase. And we are looking for writers who can ask the big questions, uh, who establish a point of view, an identity, uh, a voice. I think uh, Rachel Held Evans talked about that voice, uh, establishing your unique point of view. It's, it's not as broad as you would think, and the more specific it is, the better. Um, and if you can uh, discover that view, you can have a lot of things to say about a lot of different topics and keep writing all those different books. One thing I'd like to cover uh, that I think answers a lot of questions about how publishing works is um, to answer the question of, um, should you self-publish? Now, I'm not going to go into how uh, self-publishing works per se. I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, but uh, I think what I'm going to do is talk about instead um, why you would want to work with a publisher as opposed to self-publishing. Now, it's true. If you self-publish, you can realize more of the revenue for yourself. Um, you don't have to share that with a middle with a middleman, with a, with a publisher. Uh, you, instead of getting the, you know, the, the, 10 or 12 or 15% royalty that you might see from a publisher, you'll get 50%. Sounds a lot better. Uh, publish, Self-publishing seems to be a lot shorter. You can get your book out there a lot more quickly. And, um, uh, and who needs a publisher these days anyway? Because all the way books are all sold is on Amazon uh, or maybe Barnes & Noble too. And I think that's just all that is just partly true. I think it works for certain authors who already have really strong platforms. Um, and self-publishing certainly serves a purpose if what you're looking to do is uh, just reach a smaller audience and you need someone to help you package your, your writing and your content into book form. And all those things are fine and good. And I think it's a, it's a good exercise to go through. But I think what you, you, you definitely do want to try and aim for landing a, a, a deal with a publishing house. So let's talk about uh, the three main reasons why uh, it's great to work with a publisher. One is um, distribution. You know, that's that's uh, simply it. There's really no match for getting your books uh, well distributed. 
Um, you don't want to give up on physical stores. There are still plenty of them out there and exciting things are happening along those lines. Uh, there's much wider reach than you'd think. Besides some of the obvious places like uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million, uh, there are there are independents, independent bookstores all over the country. Just in the Christian marketplace, uh, I believe there's as many as uh, twelve to fifteen hundred independent. Uh, well, let me just say, let me let me back that up. There's probably more like seven hundred independent bookstores, and then there are Christian retail bookstores as well, which number in about. Uh, 500 or so. I don't think my math is really sounding all that right, but uh, it's it's a significant marketplace and we do a lot of business both to independent Christian bookstores as well as independent broad market bookstores, um, as well as bookstore chains like Family Christian and Lifeway stores. Um, there are specialty stores. There's major craft store chains right now that are, that are starting to sell our books uh, in ways we had not seen before. Uh, they're kind of picking up the slack uh, where some of the physical bookstores have shut down, uh, the craft stores are actually starting to carry more and more books. Uh, drug stores, gift shops, hospital gift shops, uh, businesses, large corporations that buy books, we know how to reach those uh, the people at those corporations. We have the relationships to realize book sales there, especially good if you're thinking about writing leadership books. Uh, church distribution. You know, we may not be a denominational publishing house, uh, but we've got tremendous distribution into churches. We've got a catalog called Church Source uh, that gets out there and reaches reaches folks. And most publishers have some way of getting their content out to churches. Um, Ebooks. You think it's as simple as just getting the book on Amazon? Well, it's not really all that simple. Um, you know, we work really hard to position our books with Amazon. We have dedicated uh, staffers who work with the ebook team at Amazon. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not, it's not a slam dunk as though we've gotten a great in with them. Uh, but at the same time, we know how to position books well and uh, get them to uh, help promote them. We get the books onto subscription services. We're really looking for the ways, any old way, any, any possible way that you can get um, eBooks out there. We've got d a dedicated uh, salespeople who are making sure that that happens. Um, Audiobooks, if we don't directly publish them, we're seeking licensees who will take them on on our behalf, like an like a Audible or um, Brilliance Audio. Um, libraries, that's a significant market as well. And then, of course, there's also international Eng English language distribution, particularly to the UK, uh, South Africa, and Australia. Uh, but there's also licensing foreign language rights for your book. Um, this is this is quite a list if you get it all down and you see it on paper um, you know a publisher is getting your book out into places that that you wouldn't see if you were self-publishing if you were deciding to just go on Amazon uh, direct publishing um, again those have their purposes but you're gonna miss out on a whole lot and it's not so much the um, just the the vehicle, you know, or the venue. It's the relationship that your publisher has with all of these different accounts where those accounts like a, like a family Christian store can trust our, our uh, sales rep to bring content that's gonna work for their channel, for their store. Um, like I said earlier, it's a relational business. So that relationship is a relationship of trust and mutual understanding and uh, that really, it really counts. And that's, I think, where the real leverage of getting books out in the marketplace comes from, not just uploading a book onto a self-publishing uh, website. So not only do we have a great sales staff with those relationships involved, but we also bring incredible marketing experience. Uh, we have the opportunity to work with a number of authors who are very successful at their publishing. And we come to learn the, 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 the tricks, the best practices, the latest and the greatest ways of connecting your book with uh, people, with your readers. Um, it's a very fast moving uh, field right now, marketing, book marketing, um, very digitally oriented, uh, still have some print ads and digital space ads out there, of course. Um, PR is still really important, getting great media hits for your book. Again, back to the, the aspect, this is a relational business. We have 
A lot of publishers have dedicated uh, PR staff who um, are, you know, me, who have relationships with some of the major media, whether it's New York um, broad market media or Christian media. Uh, you know, the you know the content gatekeepers at those venues come to trust uh, the the staffers at publishing houses to feed them the right kind of uh, content that is going to be great for their media vehicle. Um, and that's not that's not something that you can get very easily or very expertly. Um, or as focus with in self-publishing. Uh, and then finally, and this is certainly in my book, definitely not least, last but not least, is uh, great, great editing. Um, on our team, we have nearly 100 years of um, editing experience. It's just extraordinary. I feel like I'm working with the gurus in editing. Um, these are people who have helped uh, unknown authors go from writing a really good book to writing a great book that really catches on. Um, I'm not going to get too you know, deep into some of the details, but um, I can think of one editor who worked with a very famous author who submitted his book one way, and the editor rewrote the first chapter for him in a, in a much more story-driven, uh, much more winsome style. And uh, that book came out to be a million-selling book. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it would have happened anyway, um, but when you are behind the scenes and you see the difference between the two manuscripts and just how engaging they are for a reader, um, it, you know, you become convinced as to what the role of the publisher and what editors play in putting a good book together. You know, they can help you talk about your concept and get it get it really refined. Uh, the structure of the book, how does it begin? What's it? How do you sustain tension throughout? The entire manuscript and how does it end well? Uh, what's the tone? Uh, what are some of the story elements that you are going to bring into it? What's some of the research that you're going to do? Um, how do you clear permissions and how do you avoid uh, legal pitfalls with uh, with your manuscript uh, in terms of mentioning other people and maintaining confidentiality? A good editor is is really going to take your your good manuscript and make it great and they're they're so so incredibly valuable um some you know we have editors on our staff who've worked with some of the best known books in christian publishing and um you know just having that experience over time you know they're not perfect but uh they do gain a fund of knowledge that is just really valuable for authors um and just a final thought on this uh, on this section is uh, um, stay optimistic. Uh, being an author, I think, is a, uh, a f it's a full time hobby. Let's put it that way. It might be a full time job for you at some point, but it certainly it certainly should be seen as a um, something that you and you are strategic about. You set goals around um, that you you speak with others. You get feedback. Um, and you just keep after it a little step every single day. Uh, and you'll be surprised at how far you are a month from now, six months from now, a year from now. Um, so just want to encourage you to keep after it. Um, I know that that we, like I said, we only work with um, agented proposals for the most part. Um, so, it, you know, even just landing a deal with a agent can be a challenge. And I, I definitely understand and get that. Uh, but I think what you do, if you if you study hard, if you're a good enough student, you'll find out if this is for you um, over time. And and if it's not for you, you'll find out where you should be instead. And I would just encourage you to not go at it halfway and really learn and and, and research and inhabit inhabit the area that you uh, that you see yourself wanting to publish in. So what's going on in publishing right now, uh, and what's working? And I'm going to kind of breeze through some of this quickly. Um, hope it's not too quickly uh, but I'll just show you a bunch of slides it's kind of uh, I'm going to talk about a certain aspect to what's going on in the religious marketplace right now so I don't know how many of you have heard but um, I've got this up on the screen now um, that you know Christian retail or uh, book retail and retail in general has really been struggling with the dawn of physical distribution or uh, e-commerce distribution of physical books uh, this one article here is from the time when borders closed a few years back. Who would have thought that would have happened? That was a major bookstore chain. Um, the article on the right from Digital uh, Publishing News um, is about 
six ways Barnes & Noble can save itself. Whoa, Barnes & Noble might be struggling a little bit too. They've got this great big retail space, but it's, it's hard to pay for it all if books just aren't moving as well and they've got so much competition online. E, uh, here's another article, Barnes & Noble bets on physical bookstores. They're coming up with new ways of doing bookstores, smaller bookstores. Here's another uh, bookstore chain that closed, Amarillo's uh, Hastings Entertainment files for bankruptcy. They had a uh, 100, 123 stores uh, based out of Texas. This is news that just happened uh, in June of this year. Um, so the change in retail book publishing, a uh, book book distribution has been changing, uh, has, has been, has not let up. Um, here's a couple articles on the Christian uh, bookstore channel of uh, family Christian stores recently. Uh, last year they filed for bankruptcy and had to completely reorganize uh, their, you know, their financial uh, setup. Um, just again in the last six months, a, a major distribution, a distributor of Christian products, including books, Send the Light Distribution, S STL, um, has, uh, has also closed. And that was, that's a blow, especially I think to some of our independent stores. So there's all this change going on. Um, and one of the notions that I'd like to put to rest is that ebooks didn't really change book publishing all that dramatically. Ebooks are really only 15 to 20 percent of the nonfiction in religion, and they've leveled off. It's not growing. Um, and we can talk about that more another time, but but a lot of it has to do with just the fact that people still like paper and their tablets have so much going on in their lives, it's it's not really the place where they want to sit and rest with a book unless they're a traveler or a high volume fiction reader. Um, Ebooks just have not taken on as much as you might think. What did change dramatically is e-distribution. That did change book publishing. Online retailing is nearly 50% of distribution and still growing. Um, what I'd like to talk about is, is uh, how you create discoverability for yourself in this new era of um, e-distribution. And um, I think it's, I, I, what I'm hoping to do is inspire you a little bit about how you might think about growing your platform. So let's just get into this a little bit. I'll go through these few slides here, these next few slides here relatively quickly. How to reach readers in the cultural fragmentation of the digital era. Think about how radio used to be so prominent back, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, particularly Christian radio. Well, nowadays, there's so many alternatives to radio. There's satellite, there's streaming music, there's podcasts. Um, I just pulled up a Sirius XM uh, channel listing and just look at all these choices. You know, how is it that if you're an author trying to reach somebody on a talk radio channel, there, there are going to be so many uh, ways for uh, for for readers to tune for listeners to tune in. Um, you're not going to be able to capture the whole market all at once, like perhaps in the past. Um, so much choice in television. The second paragraph: uh, proliferation of networks and channels, streaming, Netflix, YouTube. How many church channels are there? <laughs> I, I was just looking on. Um, on, uh, I just recently signed up for um, uh, Comcast uh, in this in here where I live, and just just amazed at how many different options there are. There's even streaming, uh, you know, religious television programming on Apple TV, uh, part of Praise the Lord Television Network. Um, there's just so much choice out there. How do you dominate as a as a high platform author? Um, how do you dominate the media and, and get known? There's so many options. I mean, who knew Jim Baker was still around? I, it, it's amazing. And he's got a thriving television show. Um, so much decentralization in the church. How, how do we go from media to the church? You may be wondering. But I think, it's, I think it's all connected to this world that we live in now. Every major city has its own mega church. Essentially, in my in, the way I look at it, is uh, many denominations, uh, while major denominations have waned. Um, they're not seeing quite the cohesion and growth that they that they used to have, and their publishing distribution is lagging. A lot of the major denominations have had publishing distribution, but it's been, I think, it's been a little harder for them to have as much reach as they used to. Um, 
And, you know, at, at one point when mega churches first started coming on the scene, there was just uh, probably a very small handful and everybody was looking to those churches for how to do non-denominational church in the current era. But now um, every market has, uh, every major city has its own set of mega churches with their own publishing programs in a sense, their own, certainly their own um, curriculum and uh, video distribution of their, of their messages. So that, that also from a pastor's point of view makes it harder to create a very big network. So no one has, that's the thing these days, there just isn't as much of the, of the big presence by being on a particular channel. Uh, so that sounds kind of depressing. Like, what do we do now? It's all fragmented. Well, what I'd like to argue for, here's a little slide about just um, what's gone on with the Southern Baptists um, and the growth with non-denominational churches from 2007 to 2014, titled Rise of Denomination Denominationalism in America. What I'd, what I'd like to, t to talk about next is um, how do we go from, from this sort of uh, fragmentation that's gone on uh, from, from, the, from the sort of big uh, wholesale media to this fragmented world we live in now, this fragmented digital world. And I'd like to talk about how do we create ways to discover the books that you write? Um, and what is the, your image of discoverability? For me, what you see right here, this picture of an academic library shelf is my image of discoverability. Um, I love to go into a library and go to a section that I'm interested in and just see all the books that are there. I just, I just love it. Um, here's someone's personal library. And then I just look at all those books. I can't imagine. There's a lot of fat books there. Um, I can't imagine just steeping myself over a lifetime in all these books. And here's a bookstore just wandering through these shelves, looking for the books that, that, that would be, uh, this, this blogger called it reconnecting with loved ones. I think that might've been the title of her blog that talked about other things, but I just really resonated with that, <laughs> with that phrase, reconnecting with loved ones. Um, so how do you, what's your image of discoverability for you and your writing? And this is the comment, the comment I'd like to make on this time that we live in. Uh, this digital era that we're in, it, what I'd call it is a cultural deepening in the digital era. We've gone deeper, more vertical in, in our interests than broad. So who still watches the same TV show when you go to work? Everyone's watching something else. How many are tuning into Netflix? How much have your music listening interests changed in the, over the years? I, I've become much more drilled down into certain kinds of music than I used to be when it was just classic rock radio stations. Where do you get your news? I mean, there's just no one channel for these things. So it's all about identifying and building and engaging your tribe online. That has shown real significant uh, progress in terms of book sales and publishing. Um, and that's where um, authors have created their own image of discoverability. And everybody uses something different. Some specialize in more than one, some specialize in just one a venue like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, a blog, using search well or podcasts, many of which really point to doing email newsletters. That's really the, the most effective way of um, reaching your audience. If you can build up a solid email newsletter, um, that's getting something in someone's inbox seems to have the best uh, traction for catching their attention. And it's also a, a good a good uh, sizable email newsletter list is one that um, uh, will catch the attention of a publisher in a proposal. Um, so, let's see if I had any more final points on that. Um, I think that uh, I th what, what's key, I think, as a writer is, is to think about um, how do you get your books <clears throat> discovered? <clears throat> um, who do you, what circles are you in? How are you connected to other people? How do you get in front of them? Um, I think you can do a lot of that in a lot of different ways, but I would certainly look at um, learning how to do that through um, connecting to people digitally. <clears throat> and I'd like to take just a, a few more minutes, five more minutes or so before taking questions to talk about uh, movements and meanings in writing and in publishing. 
how do we write about what's going on in our world and make sense of it? <clears throat> um, we don't live in a vacuum as writers. Uh, there are so many issues going on, and I've got a list of them here, uh, that all have a way of impacting the people that you're trying to write for, uh, who your readers are. And uh, for me, an author that is um, really proposing something unique, a great concept that's going to work well, <clears throat> is someone who can see some of the underlying emotions and feelings and worries and concerns that are going on in our time today and, and in their own way write to those concerns. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so you see that list there. I'll just let you read it for a moment. The s slides are not up uh, at the moment, David. Okay. <clears throat> Just a moment. I'll be right with you. <clears throat> Some of these issues are... <clears throat> Terrorism and collective anxiety, Sir Syrian refugees and displacement and pain, technology and distraction and unlimited choice, women, women entering the workforce and the challenge of doing it all, the rebirth of our cities and interdependent living, the influx of millennials and transparency and authenticity that, authenticity that they care so much about, the growth of non-denominational churches in placeless suburbia, class and race separation and overcoming our indifference, and what else? I mean, I'm sure each of you could add to this list. Uh, here's three books that I think are writing to our time in their own way. These were all published by Zondervan in, in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, first, perhaps you've heard of uh, The Purpose Driven Life. Uh, what on earth am I here for? It's the expanded edition. This is, you, perhaps you can see, it's considered the best-selling nonfiction hardback in history. Um, over 32 million copies sold, <clears throat> really just extraordinary. And one of the ways I like to think about this book, about Rick Warren's amazing, amazing book here, is that in a world of relative prosperity, uh, we all needed a stronger sense of meaning. We needed a stronger sense of purpose. We needed to, to see how um, our purpose is in our faith. It's not defined by our jobs, by where we live, by the clothes we wear by our success, but it's by something much more timeless and meaningful and eternal. And that's what Rick so uh, Rick Warren so expertly captured. Um, next book, Not a Fan by Kyle Adaman. Not a fan, being a completely committed follower of Jesus. I believe that this was a, a book that was written for a church that had become lost in, in the fandom of the worship wars um, and needed to recommit to Christ. I think that's what Kyle's book is all about. This is not um, a put down of modern church movement, but it's more of a call to stay true to Christ uh, and, and stay committed in your faith in the process. And then finally, 1,000 Gifts by Ann Voskamp. Uh, 1,000 Gifts, A Dare to Live Fully Right Where You Are. It's a beautiful, beautiful book um, that chronicles a thousand ways that the author uh, sought out gratitude and thankfulness uh, in her life. And I believe that this is a book uh, that's speaking to, this is just my theory, uh, lives caught in right living that needed to reconnect to God's love through gratitude. Lives caught in right living that needed to reconnect to God's love through gratitude. Now, I don't know that any of these really connect so well to the to the slide from before and, and the, the anxieties and the worries and the concerns, but they each strategically are picking something um, that's speaking to people's hearts, even if they don't know it, even if they've not articulated it. Um, so let me just, let me just conclude uh, by saying that um, I really do encourage you in your, your uh, writing career um, I think that it's it's very important to know that a lot of what you might say, as I see on this, as you, as I say on this slide, um, everything that you can say has been said before. 
uh, but not for the time we live in. Um, you are unique, just like a painter, an actor, a speaker, or a musician. Um, my, my wife is a, a flutist, and she's trying out for, um, she's trying out for uh, a flute orchestra. And she was, I heard her downstairs in the basement um, playing um, this beautiful flute piece as she was going to audition for this flute orchestra. And um, it just sounded wonderful. And I could just hear her, her own voice as a flute player in it. And then she went upstairs and punched in the piece into the computer and listened to a famous flutist named Jean-Pierre Rampal. And, and to listen to him play it, and it was different. And it was funny to hear her comment. She's like, oh, he's a show off. He's playing it so fast. And um, uh, it, was, it was just unique, you know, to hear him playing it and then my wife hearing it play it. It's the same piece, but they have their different ways of interpreting it. And I think as a writer, you have that unique voice. And there may be three authors coming out with a book on shame like happened just this past may one of them being our authors but each one had a different way of going about it and each one captured um, their own readership so i, I just want to conclude by saying that there's always fresh expressions of timeless truth there's the quote in uh, corinthians how in christ we're always being made new and i believe for christians that's that's a daily weekly monthly yearly process and in writing it's always a, a book by book process and then in uh in in hebrews i believe it is rick warren likes to quote how uh you know david was a good servant for the time that he lived in the books you write ought to be for the time that you live in not just something that's being uh written into a vacuum and uh that's all i've got for now maybe more later but uh, happy to take some questions well, David, thank you so much. This was really insightful, and I really loved the way that you um, talked about, you know, some of the large things going on within our industry, and your presentation covered areas that are different than the other presenters that we've had. So that's a really useful aspect of this too, I think. So um, we'll start taking questions from the um, the online group, but uh, I'll go ahead and start with a couple. When your team reviews a manuscript, what are the most important things that you look for? Sure. Uh, we're looking for uh, definitely even the title, even though it's a working title, is important, I think, to get editors into the concept. Uh, we're looking for a really good um, brief description of the concept. Uh, what very well crafted, how is it unique? Uh, what's it about? Uh, what's what's the book actually going to talk about? What's going to be on the inside? Not just what are the benefits and the whys of why you should read it. Um, we're certainly looking at a annotated uh, table of contents, but we really like to get to that writing sample as well and see if uh, your concept can be well carried by the delivery of your writing. Um, we're absolutely looking for a platform. Um, digital online platform is, is really important. Speaking is really important. Um, if it's a book that has great uh, media hooks, it'll get the attention of uh, the media out there because it's very topical or it, it, it grabs a topic that's in the news and, and helps us deal with it. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's an important key uh, part of it as well. So both the, both the writing and the platform, I think, are um, equally important uh, aspects that we look at. So um, one of the things that you've mentioned earlier in your presentation is that most of the authors that um, Zondervan deals with have agents. So um, what kind of opportunity do you see for someone who has yet to find that right agent? Um, yeah, I think, I think first of all, you want to find out who those agents are that are out there. There are online uh, lists of uh, literary agents, both Christian and, and broader market. Um, again, I, I, I would research, research, research on, on who they are, what are the other books that they've published. Make yourself sound like you know what you're talking about, and you will if you do all that research. Um, and you know, if you just if you get a rejection from an agent, it just might be that it's not quite the right time. That uh, you know, maybe the concept needs work. Uh, certainly, that's something I always keep looking at. But that doesn't mean you should stop building your platform. 
um, doing some getting getting your you know finding finding venues where you could do some speaking and share your ideas um, build up your blog whatever that might be for you um, but I think eventually you know agents I, I do rely on agents quite a bit to help us um, to kind of be uh, our eyes and ears out in the marketplace um, and uh, you know establish relationships with some of the authors that we might work with and I know they're working hard doing that and then they're also really good advocates for the author uh, throughout the process both for the author and the publisher they can sort of translate between the author and the publisher and it really enables um, a, an author to um, be effective in their in their publishing work so I think um, is it safe to say then that most of the new authors that Zondervan has found have come through your agent relationships yeah I, definitely and you know certainly that's the state of things right now probably 95 percent of them are agented books so here's a good question from Kendall um, is there a particular time of the year when either agents or publishers are most receptive to new manuscripts and are there other times of the year when you probably just ought to not bother uh, you know, I don't think so. Actually, I think we're we're here on our jobs all year long, just like everybody else, and um, uh, we plan way way out in advance. So the sooner we can get started on something, the better. I mean, everybody does take vacations typically in the summer, and things slow down a little bit. But um, you know, we're you know we're trying to make our business work from month to month, quarter to quarter. And uh, sometimes summer is a little bit slower. We get fewer proposals then. And frankly, I would say that's a great time to send in a proposal because, uh, um, or to have an agent submit one for you uh, because we're not seeing as much uh, from other agents. It definitely gets very, it definitely picks up in the fall. Um, people, people seem to be you know, getting their proposals together and, and getting them out to publishers. Um, but I would say there's no, busy time to avoid it's more like what are the slower times to take advantage of um, maybe fall is a little bit busy in terms of all the proposals we're seeing um, but i think uh, i think we're always eager we we you know most agent and proposals we give them a pretty good look um, so if you get it in through an agent you can know that it's um it's definitely being looked at regardless of what time of year it is well, that's really good to know. I think that's a great tip to uh, try to get your uh, proposal in during the summer when things are slower. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, Kendall. <laughs> so here's another really good question. Uh, um, how much does prayer figure in on the decision process around a book? Um, mm -hmm. you know, I know you have your editor's meetings and it's kind of a collaborative process to make those kinds of mm -hmm. decisions, but mm -hmm. can you talk, I mean, given that you're a Christian publisher, how much does sure. prayer enter into that process? Sure, sure. That's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, we start our editor meeting with a prayer. We start um, our um, pub board meeting with a prayer. Uh, we ask for guidance on making good decisions um, about um, bringing strength and energy to our discussion and to let the Holy Spirit lead us um, in, in uh, being good shepherds of the content that's, that's before us that we're working on. Um, so I'd say that it's an integral part of our uh, decision-making process. Do we pray about uh, one manuscript or, or one proposal over another? Uh, absolutely. I think more on the uh, acquisition editor level or a marketer level, there, we're, we're all praying about um, you know, letting God lead us in uh, what we're doing, uh, letting him be the driver of the bus, um, not our will, but his will. Um, with with each manuscript that we're working on, we really have to put it in his hands. You know, it's not possible really to predict the future. And um, I think if we trust, uh, we trust God with every every uh, decision we we make when we come to work every day. Um, that uh, we you know we can we can go far with great confidence. That that's great. I think that that's really good for people to know too. So I'm glad that you. I'm glad that. Uh, um, Carrie asked that question. Thanks, so, Carrie. 
<laughs> you talked about at the beginning of your presentation, kind of the three segments of you know the publishing industry as it relates to spiritual writers: the denominational segment, the evangelical segment, and then kind of the general mm -hmm. trade you know segment. And I know you also mentioned that the denominational segment is kind of um, struggling just because the denominations themselves you know are decreasing in terms of attendance, just in terms right. of a general trend. How would you contrast the growth rates within the evangelical? publishing segment versus the general trade segment? Um, probably during the 19, late 1990s, um, into the 2000s, the uh, evangelical Christian publishing was really maturing and coming into its own. It was seen as the number one growth area in all of publishing. Um, and it's it's matured and it's stayed very mature. Uh, you know, even though a lot of the Christian bookstores have shut down, um, the, there's still many, many evangelicals out there who really want to read. And it's, it's, the business has been growing. Um, I wouldn't say that it's flattened off per se. I think it's just as big as ever. Um, it's just more the way the distribution happens is different. Um, so uh, could you repeat that, the last part of that question again? No, it was really, I mean, pretty much what you're, what you're saying is to kind of compare the growth rates between the evangelical Christian segment right, right, and right. the more general trade, you know, kind of like your Harper One um, subsidiary or, you right. know, one of the other ones that you mentioned. Are they growing also? Are they growing more than the, or less than the, the Christian evangelical segment to, to the extent that you're able to measure that? Uh, it's hard for me to say for sure how, uh, factually, how things are going um, in, in those divisions. I guess I'm just speaking more anecdotally. I could say that um, that every major broad market publisher based in New York has wanted to be a part of the Christian publishing business. Uh, so Simon and Schuster uh, has Howard, um, Hachette has Faith Words, uh, Random Penguin has Waterbrook Multnomah. Uh, sorry for all these names. Um, and uh, of course, Harper Collins has uh, Zondervan and Thomas Nelson. Um, and you know, depending on each situation, they all operate fairly independently of the major New York house. Uh, but it's it's pretty pretty big business. And um, I I would say that maybe it's in its own sort of universe, but it's 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 very healthy. And uh, I think it's reaching a more consolidated and more um, a less fragmented audience than, say, Tarcher or maybe Harper One, even though those are those are very important books and reaching very important uh, very important markets as well. And I think that there's some cross distribution opportunities, if I'm not mistaken, in a larger company like Harper, where you know you've got the different divisions that have their own focus, but the distribution channels for each one of those respective um, divisions are not exclusive to each other. Uh, no, but I think that uh, it, it depends on the situation uh, with HarperCollins Christian Publishing. You know, we have um, our own sales staff that can reach all markets, whether it's um, broad market or secular or Christian markets. Uh, we can reach the Barnes and Noble buyer uh, just as easily as a uh, broad market uh, New York house. Um, so, so there is, there is a, a great deal of reach these days. Um, if, uh, if you have uh, a big enough company to devote that many um, sales staffers to it, and even if you have a small company, uh, there's still a, a pretty good reach that you can, you can carve out for yourself. So often a different direction here um, for first time author is, a memoir, a good place to start? Yeah, a memoir can be a good place to start because it tells your story. Um, it can get the attention of a reader. Um, and uh, speak from uniquely who you are. Um, I would just be cautious that you understand what a memoir is. It's not your life story. It's not a chronology. It's not an autobiography. Um, a memoir is a, um, oh, let's say it, it conveys a feeling. It conveys a sentiment. It conveys a thought. 
and uh, how does your story um, how does your story accomplish that not not so much how does all everything you've experienced all lead up to that but how do you tell parts of your story um, so that they all shed light on this one thought um, you know, and, and, you know, I think, I think it is, I think it can be a pretty good place to start. If you've got some, it helps if you have something unique to a very unique experience. Um, if you've gone through, or if you've put yourself through some, you know, incredible kind of self-taught education, um, if it's an extreme experience of some kind, um, but, but sometimes those can even pigeonhole you into a certain kind of author and memoir. If you want to write more like a Philip Yancey or an Ann Voskamp, um, you kind of want to take on bigger questions and then let your story as perhaps well as others help inform those questions. So, so memoir can possibly pigeonhole you just a little bit. Um, and, and you, you don't want to shortchange asking those big questions that I was talking about earlier. How do you, how do you connect to the big questions of our time? Uh, Philip Yancey did it in the sense of asking really tough questions about our faith of, Questions that we're afraid to ask in church, um, you know, like being disappointed with God. How do you express that when you're when you're going to church on a Sunday morning? Um, Anne Voskamp talks about um, her latest book coming out in October about brokenness and and heartache and hardship, and how we can find abundance in brokenness. Um, and both of those books rely to some extent, Anne's in particular, on her own stories. Um, and, and in a way, that's really the better vehicle for mo memoir when you're talking about getting into Christian publishing. So within Harper Christian, Christian publishing, um, besides Zondervan, there's also Thomas Nelson, and there's also W, is that correct? Another imprint? Yeah, that's more of an internal uh, uh, publishing distinction and uh, industry-wide distinction in terms of uh, a different set of um, a different list of books um, but they W is published on the spine it says Thomas Nelson um, so it's more under that Thomas Nelson uh, uh, name and under okay. Thomas Nelson there's actually Nelson books and W publishing okay so how would you contrast the books that Thomas Nelson in either one of those forms um, publishes versus Sondervan uh, well if any of my colleagues are watching just turn Close, shut down your ears. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would say that uh, Zondervan is a little bit more core uh, evangelical, uh, more for the person in the pew, whereas, uh, uh, and, and to some extent, the same would be true of W. Um, you know, I think that W has been a little bit better at getting the super high profile authors, uh, some celebrities even. Uh, they've got a great book coming out by uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines of the Fixer Upper television show. Um, whereas we at Zondervan have got, uh, you know, uh, just amazing pastors. Craig Grishel is one of our authors, one of the largest churches in America. And um, uh, Nelson Books is, uh, you know, they publish all of what, all of the above as well, but also uh, books that get a little bit more historical, perhaps a little more political. Um, that reach sort of a little more outside of uh, the person in the pew, so to speak. Well, this has been really wonderful, David. I appreciate you spending some time with us. Just as kind of like our finishing point, are there any pieces of advice you'd like to give to aspiring new writers? Well, just thanks for your interest. Um, the long form book is here to stay and uh, print is here to stay. And uh, it has a way of impacting people that a movie can't, that a great sermon or a great speech uh, can't. Um, a book is a great medium in and of itself. Um, I think one of the other presenters, Chris Faraby, mentioned how people thought they could start publishing short books and 20,000 word books. I don't think so. I think that you still need that, that immersive experience of a book. It can truly change lives. It can become something that's so powerful for you that you want to uh, pass it on to others and just tell other people about it. That's the amazing, amazing things about book about books. Um, I was just listening to an audio book this past weekend, and I mean, you know, my wife sure got an earful about how it's inspired and encouraged me. And uh, I just encourage you to keep after it and um you know work hard 
uh, you know, fine tune, uh, find others to work with you and, uh, you'll get there. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, David, thank you so much again for joining us uh, today.